board oversight and the questions the board should ask of management regarding cybersecurity, we will hear from WCD member Leslie Ireland, former Assistant Secretary for Intelligence and Analysis at the U.S. Department of the Treasury, and Richard Leggett, Jr., former Deputy Director of the National Security Agency. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to uh, all of you joining us here uh, near the close of this wonderful Global Institute with uh, women corporate directors. Um, I am happy to be here today to talk to you about cybersecurity as a threat landscape and how corporate boards need to think about oversight. Uh, as you know from my bio, I spent a career in national security and, and I'm happy to bring those skills and understanding to the board of Citigroup and the Stimson Center. And I am really honored today to be joined by my friend and colleague, uh, Rick Leggett. Uh, Rick was the former deputy director of NSA. Uh, we worked together closely in the government and I'm really pleased to see him continuing to put his talents to use on corporate boards, in particular m and Bank and, and in um, other areas in the private sector. So uh, welcome Rick. Thanks, Leslie. I appreciate it. And uh, I'm glad to be here with the Women Corporate Directors group. Um, I thought I would start by talking about the threat. Uh, and um, so I'm going to skate fast uh, during this part because uh, we're, we're a little limited in time. But um, I'll start with nation state threats, which are the big, uh, the big capable actors around the world. And there are four that we principally worry about. They are Russia, China, Iran, and North Korea. Russia is a very capable actor. They've got uh, three services that do cyber, the SVR, which is roughly equivalent to the CIA, the FSB, which is roughly equivalent to NSA, and the GRU, which is kind of a combination of CIA and DIA military intelligence. And GRU is particularly important because they have information operations as a mission. So they're not just hacking in to steal information. That's what the SVR and the FSB do. They're hacking in to weaponize information and do things to you. For example, the GRU was behind the attack against the OPCW, the uh, Organization for the Prevention of Chemical Weapons in, uh, in the Netherlands. They were rolled up outside the gate. They were, they were uh, working to penetrate the network and then they were gonna do uh, bad things with the information they discovered. They're also the people behind the poisoning of Sergei Skripal in uh, the UK. Um, they smeared Novichuk uh, nerve agent on his doorknob and they got him and his sister and oh, by the way, they killed a woman who found the perfume sprayer that they used for that. They, they didn't really care. Um, so that's the, the Russians and they are, are very capable. Uh, the SVR was behind the um, uh, uh, solar, solar winds attack, sorry. Um, they, uh, they launch uh, long, well-resourced intelligence uh, efforts against targets that they care about, uh, like solar winds, which was um, unique because it was targeting as a supply chain attack. So they targeted the place where all the, uh, the software came together, which was the solar wind software. They targeted that um, and they uh, were able to uh, exploit something around a hundred companies. Um, the Chinese uh, have two main actors, the Ministry of State Security and the, um, the Cybersecurity Forces. Uh, they are, uh, the MSS is roughly equivalent to CIA and DIA and the MS or the uh, CSF is roughly equivalent to, uh, to NSA. And they um, both do um, uh, everything from um, st uh, stealing information, uh, including intellectual property to advantage Chinese business. It's stuff that has nothing to do with military or political intelligence, but stuff that uh, enables their companies to compete against American companies around the world. They do that um, through com uh, combined uh, human and uh, cyber operations. So they'll hack in, they'll also have people that they will leverage by um, to to put a thumb drive in a machine or to make a connection so they can then uh, move through uh, the cyber uh, channels to get access to the stuff they need. They are um, uh, an, a very real and insidious threat and there are a lot of them, uh, as you might imagine. Iran is a regional actor. Um, they're mainly concerned with Saudi Arabia, 
uh, with Israel and with the United States. Um, and they've got the, um, the Ministry of Internal Security and the Iranian Revolutionary Guard uh, Corps, the Quds Force that, that do the hacking. And they are, um, are very capable, but they're, as I said, regionally focused. And then North Korea is uh, unique because they're the only nation state that actually uh, robs banks uh, to generate uh, currency for, for the regime. Um, sanctions have caused them to, to take a bank robbery as a hobby, actually as a job. And they are also behind lots of cryptocurrency thefts going after exchanges. Um, and uh, if you want a really good lay down of the um, North Koreans, David Sanger from the New York Times wrote a piece a few years back. They did a really good job of laying it out. Um, search on Sanger and Reconnaissance General Bureau and it'll take you right to it. And then on the criminal side, um, I'm not gonna talk about the groups unless it comes up in questions, but, but the big concern obviously is ransomware. You saw what happened with Colonial, um, you saw what happened with JBS uh, Foods, um, and that is the very, very tip of the iceberg. There are um, uh, you know, at least a hundred times more ransomware acts than you see in the press. Last May, I was talking to a company that brokered uh, conversations between ransomware victims and the ransomware. Their job was to, you know, ne help negotiations, help them pay the, the ransom. And they, um, they had 170 um, clients, and that was in one week, 170 in one week. Um, so the ransomware is, is out of control. There's a really good report by uh, Megan Stifel and um, John Davis. Uh, they co-chaired a group that, that wrote a report a couple of weeks ago on ransomware um, that uh, lays it out really well. And they um, characterize it as a national security threat. And I, I believe that's right. Well, um, thank you, Eric. That's sobering. And I think that um, you can pick up a newspaper any day of the week and see what uh, see what's uh, what's out there and what the challenge is. What I wanted to do at this point, and I'm going to ask Rick to jump in as well, is to talk about how should corporate boards, uh, what are five key areas of governance that um, we as corporate directors need to be thinking about? And then I uh, wanted to toss out some questions that uh, uh, directors can be asking of, uh, of management in order to better understand a company's posture, because that's really going to be critical. Uh, the first thing I would say is it's a matter of when and not if, and that everybody just needs to think about this that way. It's easy to see these things happen in the media and think, thank goodness that's not us, but it could be us uh, at, at any moment. So I think the first thing that's important for a company, for a corporate board to understand is what is your company's risk profile? And, and that really is um, centered on what do you need, what have you got that you need to protect? And as Rick mentioned, you know, we've, we've really walked into a time where ransomware uh, is almost an everyday occurrence, if not an everyday occurrence. And so I'd argue that the things that we used to think we needed to protect, we need to be expanding that list because there is information that maybe you wouldn't have thought of as business sensitive, but in fact, it is being held hostage now. And um, you have to think about how you're gonna protect that. It's also important for the board to know you've got a risk profile. H how are you doing? How are you doing at protecting what you've got? Um, this week, the, the United States has created a position of the national cyber director. And yesterday I was listening to the nomination and confirmation hearings uh, for members of the cyber team. And then uh, a nominee, Chris Inglis, said, you know, basically there are three things, um, two-factor authentication, um, patching regularly, and network segmentation that would take care of about 85% of this problem. You really need to be looking at, is your company doing that as it's looking at its risk profile? Uh, do you know the uh, cybersecurity posture of your vendors and your suppliers? It, Rick mentioned solar winds. That was a vulnerability, not necessarily within a company, but because of the suppliers. Um, and you know, your profile is gonna depend upon the threat landscape. It would be helpful if your CISO could give you the kind of uh, rundown uh, that Rick gave us today. And finally, I'd say on that one area, you've gotta remember that cybersecurity is an enterprise wide risk. It poses legal, regulatory, reputational, 
um, operational and possibly systemic risks depending upon the industry that you're in. And something that you might wanna consider is a risk appetite statement. Uh, certainly risk appetite statements are something that are commonplace in the financial sector. And I think in this area, it could be uh, important in others. Um, second area, how did your board organize itself to provide oversight and challenge? And it's not one size fits all. It's gonna depend upon your company. Some companies do it within a particular committee, whether it's audit or risk, or uh, maybe you set up a separate cybersecurity committee. Some companies do it within uh, the entire corporate board. The point being, uh, you should be able to ask and get the information you need and the regularity that you need it and have the kinds of discussions that'll make you feel comfortable. Um, thirdly, I think you need to set some expectations for management about uh, escalation policies, communication with the board, how are, how are you as a board member going to know if there has been a cyber incident and have that kind of plan laid out before you get there. Uh, one good way to do that is to conduct tabletop exercises. Uh, we did those when I was in the government. We did those between the government and the financial sector. As Rick can tell you, they do them uh, exercises in the military. It is a, it is a, an excellent way to find out where the problems lie, how to think about solving them beforehand, because I can assure you the day of, there will be things that come up that you will not plan for. And if you can take care of what's planned for in the beginning, uh, you're in a better uh, place. Um, you know, there's a lot of discussion in, um, in the media, particularly in the wake of a cyber incident as to who is, who is really responsible. Part of your um, personnel evaluations and, um, and compensation uh, could very well be expanded to include how cybersecurity is addressed within the company. And finally, I think it's very important that you as a board have an opportunity to uh, monitor and get regularly updated on the status of um, such issues within, um, within the company. So, you know, one of the things I mentioned earlier was the issue of two-factor authentication, uh, patching, et cetera, network segmentation. Those are the kinds of things that if you are having issues in your company, you need to be regularly updated on the status and the performance. And a good way to do that is through a dashboard. A dashboard is something that management could deliver to the board regularly, um, go over the high points. And I think most importantly, uh, have a CISO team that is very transparent about both where they are having successes, where they are having problems, um, so that the board can provide some oversight in terms of how those problems are addressed. Now, let me run through about half a dozen things that I think that uh, boards can be asking um, of, their, um, uh, of their management teams. Uh, one is, what kind of a framework does the CISO use to evaluate the status of the program? I you know, heard in earlier sessions today, you've got to measure things. Absolutely. If you don't have measurements, you aren't going to know where you're going. Now there's the National Institute of Standards and Technology or the NIST framework. There are some sectors that have modified that framework to accommodate their own um, needs, but finding out what, are the, what is the framework that the CISO is using is important. Um, do you know what the key functions and um, six systems and networks of your company are? In other words, do you know what you need to be protecting the most? Because the answer is not to protect everything. Uh, it's too expensive, it's impossible, it will frustrate your business. But knowing what you have to protect is a step in the right direction. Then knowing how well you're protecting it, what is your resiliency, how long does your, you know, what is your backup how long does it take to restore? These are the kinds of questions that, for example, we've seen recently some ransomware attacks that, that took down distribution capabilities or interrupted operational capabilities. That's when you need to know uh, how long will that take you to come back up again. Um, I'd highly recommend asking about a penetration test. When Rick and I worked together in the government, his folks helped uh, my office do just that. Come in, find out how easy is it to get into the network? Where are the vulnerabilities? What are the things that need to be done? 
um, to correct those vulnerabilities. Uh, does your company have a cyber insurance policy? If it does, you need to get briefed on it. Do you have a ransomware policy? In other words, are you gonna make payments? And answers to, the, to a lot of the other questions that I was just talking to you about, especially in terms of backup or resiliency will inf should influence your decision on ransomware. And then finally, uh, does your company have an insider threat program? Um, an area I don't think gets enough conversation, but I'll give you an example. In the dark web, you can go in and find criminals who are either A, advertising access to login credentials at financial institutions, or trying to find people who will provide that kind of information in an effort to steal funds. I can just touch the surface of that, but I want to turn this over to Rick because he has much more direct experience with this kind of problem. Thanks, Leslie. Um, one thing one thing I wanted to say before I started on the insider threat thing was this um, uh, protecting or securing your network versus defending your network. I think that's a really important distinction. Um, when you protect something or you secure something, typically you take action and you, uh, you set it up and then you're done. Um, that's not how network security works. The way network security works is you defend your network because you're under constant assault from the adversary. They're always coming up with new techniques. They're always coming up with, uh, with new tools and new ways to do it. And so defense is a more active verb. And I, I like that word uh, when you apply it to networks better. Um, sorry, just a little. Uh, a little... No, no, I take that lesson. Thank you. Yeah. Um, insider threat. You guys may have heard of, uh, of a guy named Edward Snowden. Um, I was the fortunate person at NSA who got to run the effort uh, um, the uh, uh, the press, the Congress, the White House, partners, um, foreign entities, the counterintelligence investigation, and the recapitalization of techniques after uh, after Snowden stole um, classified information that he did, and um, uh, some. I can go on for hours about this, but I but I won't. But but I did I did want to say that it's really important to, um, to uh, understand where you're vulnerable to insider threat and what the vulnerabilities are. Um, when I'm doing my uh, consulting work and I talk to companies, one thing that I always ask them is, when was your last HR survey? And can I see the last two or three of them? Um, because that'll give you indicators. You know, there's, there's little niches or pockets of unhappiness in your company. And, and those are things you should, you should look at. And everybody's not, uh, you know, uh, operating in as secure a mode as uh, the National Security Agency or um, the CIA or, or, or uh, that sort of thing. So you can't apply the same sorts of measures, but you should know um, who your people are, where they come from, uh, what they're doing, at least at work. Um, uh, and you ought to be able to um, identify risk factors that would cause you to uh, pay a little extra attention. Um, one, one thing that um, this also ties into what Leslie said earlier about um, you need to assume breach. You need to assume breach, not just for external guys who are hacking in, but for internal people, for insider threat. Mm -hmm. um, if you have behavioral analytics running on your network, if you can, if you can look at, uh, um, say you're looking at, uh, at Leslie's uh, network and Leslie normally works on topic A and all of a sudden she's spending a lot of time on topic B and pulling down documents that have to do with, uh, you know, Chinese nuclear warfare, then um, that should cause you to ask a question about what's going on. At the same, by the, at the same token, um, in the outside world, you can, you can look for, uh, for people who are, um, who are shopping resumes. Um, that's an early indicator. Um, you can look for uh, uh, people who have just gotten a bad performance review. That's another indicator. Mm -hmm. um, and it sounds a little creepy. It sounds like you're uh, like you're uh, setting up a police state. And that's that's really not it. What you're doing is you're trying to be aware of all factors that impact an employee's ability and willingness to protect your information on the network. You know, and Rick, I, I remember one thing I learned in government was, um, at least in government, most of the people where there was a problem were the systems administrators. So in other words, people that would appear to have legitimate access um, 
to be in parts of the network that you might question somebody else being in there. So I think another important thing in Insider Thread is thinking about how are you parsing out that access? How, how are you ensuring that it is the right size? And there's a balance there uh, because there's an ease of business when you give somebody those extra permissions, but there's also um, an increased risk to insider threat. Yeah, and you have to you have to manage that carefully, especially in a, a technical organization where um, you have lots of people who will, who have access to lots of servers and who are writing code and things like that. You have to manage how you apply, how you restrict permissions. You can't just say, mm -hmm. okay, today only five people instead of five hundred right. have system level access. You have to ease into that over a period of time. Yeah. So, um, Rick, we have a question here. Um, as a result of the pandemic, more of our companies moved operations to the cloud. What are your thoughts about the large versus smaller cloud providers? The larger ones may have better controls, but have a higher, do they have a higher risk profile? They have also typically been less adaptable to, as to client escalation policies and service agreements. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think, um, first off, uh, uh, two things about the cloud. One, my favorite definition is, of the cloud is somebody else's computer. So when you go to the cloud, you're putting your information on someone else's mm -hmm. computer that's not part of your organization. So there's a risk inherent in that. The cloud providers have done a good job, the big cloud providers like AWS, Google, Microsoft, Azure, have done a good job of um, writing uh, uh, agreements that and, and just uh, putting in place policies and procedures that will protect your your data. It's important to read and understand what it is you're signing up. Some people think, oh, I did to the cloud, therefore my security job is done. That's not true at all. You have to really understand, uh, you have to have cloud security brokers, things like that, in order to make sure that your data is, um, is secure. Um, the smaller cloud providers um, may offer more uh, options because they're a little hungrier. Um, I would say that um, just a straight up comparison, the larger providers, the security is probably a little better uh, because they've, they've turned it into an industry. It's not, a, it's not one guy's job or 10 guys job, it's a thousand people's job to, to do that security. So let me ask you this, and, and I, I don't know if I'm off base, but I've looked at the larger cloud providers, there's only a handful of them. Do we end up with possible concentration risk? Um, and, I, and I think particularly within a sector, so I think about the financial services sector, if you end up having a lot of, of your larger banks end up with the same large cloud providers, do you create um, unnecessary risk? And if you do, how do you mitigate something like that? Yeah, concentration risk is a is a, a um, an issue there, and as you know, concentration risk is when you have too much of, of your data all in one place. It could be you have too many feeds of software coming through one software package, and so that software package, like Solar Winds, is now a concentration risk. In the case of a provider, it could be I've got too many people from, say, the financial sector who are on AWS, and therefore that's a concentration risk. And so the way that you deal with that is you diversify. You, you use AWS and Azure, you use Google and Azure, you use Google and AWS, and other ones, um, so that you can um, make sure that you've got A, some backup capability, and B, it's a, it's a slightly less attractive target. Um, in fact, uh, the intelligence community has a new hybrid cloud initiative. And um, I was talking to someone uh, about that and, and the importance of not just going with a single provider, but going with two providers. Yeah. And, you know, I, it is my hope, and, and I know we're speaking to a global audience, but in the United States, we have an organization called the Financial Systemic, well, it's called the Financial Systemic Analysis and, Analysis and Resiliency Center. It is now the Analysis and Resiliency Center that looks at both the financial sector and the energy sector. And it's my hope that that kind of a, a grouping would be able to look at concentration risk consider it within a sector um, instead of leaving. I, I agree with you, you need to reduce that concentration risk within your own company, but I think we need to be thinking as a nation and globally about how do we reduce that concentration risk um, across the board. I, I have another um, question for you, Rick. You have a luminary today. Can you talk about identity management and specifically the new techniques for authentication? 
Yeah, so in terms of, uh, of um, authentication, you know, you've uh, got the old school, the, the password, which is um, basically dead now. Passwords are, are um, not good unless you've got 47 letters, an animal sound, and a, a, you know, a picture that constitutes your password. Um, and so, so um, there, you're, you're, you're seeing lots of multi-factor authentication. And in fact, Chris Inglis, as you, as you said, uh, mentioned multi-factor authentication as a key thing. Um, and so that's a password and something else, a password and a text or a password and an Okta or Duo, something like that, a, a second factor that lets you weigh in. Um, but uh, more than that, there, uh, there's a lot of work being done now in biometrics. Um, you know, at, at its core, authentication is about um, something you know, something you have, and something you are. So those are the three dimensions of, of authentication. So something you have is traditionally a password. Something you know is, is uh, or um, uh, excuse me, something you know is typically a password. Something you have might be a, uh, a thumb drive or uh, something that generates a token that you enter. Um, and something you are, the biometrics part, that is the, the current um, state of the art. They're, they're not really, um, optimal yet. Um, I mean, I use biometrics on my on my Apple devices. I use my thumbprint, um, recognizing that it's not really uh, all that secure. Um, but uh, for high security applications, we're probably a little bit away, maybe maybe a year or two away from having widely available biometrics. Okay, let me. There was a great question that's come up here um, because we did talk about. Solar winds and um, and and the risk presented by third-party service providers. Can you provide examples that will help with monitoring the cyber risk of third-party service providers? How is that uh, best done? So the financial sector has um, has experience with third-party risk management. They spend a lot of time and effort doing that, as, as you know, Leslie. Um, and so. You know, I'm not real happy with that model because that's basically you send out questionnaires and send out a bunch of teams to talk to people about what they do and they bring back and it's an end to end. So, uh, you know, my bank has thousands of suppliers, your bank has thousands of suppliers, and we go out thousands of times to do that. And so we need some kind of a concentration, some kind of a service that lets them do that for you and lets you go to that service and have people vet it. I think that's the, the model. I would agree with you, Rick, because certainly I think we saw during the pandemic that the ability to get out there and do that kind of surveying um, wasn't necessarily possible. And yeah. yeah. Equifax, you know, everybody, including my bank, uh, uh, you know, sent them a questionnaire, they filled it out and they just, you know, were not accurate in their response. So, yeah. So, um, We've got a couple minutes left here before we go. Um, and I think I'd like to toss out one more question to you, Rick. What are areas of investment um, that we should be thinking about for cybersecurity? Wow, that's a, that's a big topic. Um, there, are, uh, there are lots of, of areas. Anything having to do with, uh, with AI and uh, cybersecurity is hot right now. Um, and, and there's a lot there. Um, Quantum, you know, I'm real hesitant about quantum because everybody goes, ooh, quantum. Uh, but quantum is still years away. Um, but it, getting in on the ground floor is is important uh, uh, to that. And then lots of um, brokering of, uh, of um, risk management. So when you think about the concentration risk that we talked about a couple of times, um, there are entities that are looking now, are there ways to codify uh, the uh, concentration risk? And um, uh, so using AI and things like that. So are, are there ways that you can do that in order to do your, um, your risk management? Mm -hmm. um, one last comment I think I'd like to make it your thoughts on too, Rick. I think we need to look at in our country and globally, how are we investing in the cybersecurity expertise um, for the future, both in terms of starting very early uh, even in the classroom, help people become much more cyber aware and responsible for their own cyber hygiene, but also creating a culture of people who want to come and who want to work uh, in the industry and be part of it, whether it's for a startup or a tech firm or in the private sector. And women, get women, women and girls, absolutely. girls involved and have them in, be involved throughout their, uh, their lives. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Any other thoughts, Rick? No, it's been great. Thank you. 
Yeah, well, thank you for joining me and thank you for everyone who participated today. Um, and I know you've got a nice, uh, interesting conversation coming up, so we'll let you go for that. Bye-bye.